It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Salamu alaikum. Salamu alaikum. Salamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praises are Allah's, Lord of the worlds. And may his peace and blessings be upon our master, the Holy Prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate Ahlul Bayt. Ash-shari'atu aqwali wa tariqatu af'ali wa al-haqiqatu ahwali This is a prophetic tradition which is very popular and has a lot of significance attached to it especially for people who are wary and attach importance to traveling the spiritual route to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obedience to the Holy Prophet takes many different dimensions to it. In this tradition, three dimensions albeit very broadly delineated or discussed. The first is the words of the Holy Prophet, the letter of the law, the Sharia. The Vajabat, the obligatory actions that the Holy Prophet spoke about, the sins that the Holy Prophet has mentioned. In this of Islam, Islam is one reality. But this has own capacity. But the first step, which is the most essential step, You can't do without it. If you imagine hundred steps to Allah, you have to go through step one. Step one is the letter of the law. It's the Sharia. To put it simply, it's doing the Vajabat, refraining from the Muharramat. And this is important. The problem, however, is this, that some people confine Islam to the letter of the law, and that can be problematic. Islam is a multi-dimensional truth, it has many layers to it. When you confine Islam to the letter of the law, you are, in effect, limiting yourself and therefore wasting the soul in its potential and that's reaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one trap that many people fall into is that they look at the letter of the law and they become oblivious to any of its inner dimensions For example, they do the wudu, the ghusl, and the salat on a par with the letter of the law without making an endeavor to see what are the, does the ghusl, does the wudu, does the salat have any esoteric dimensions to it? Or is it the mere physical action which is important? Some people confine it to the physical movements and actions these people will suffer eventually. And it's not something that difficult to appreciate. You, you, you may see many people, they do all the wajibat, they refrain from all the muharramat, the sins, but 
they don't know how to speak with their husbands or their wives. They don't know how to speak with their children. They lie at the workplace. Oh, well, lying is haram. They don't lie. But they do many other unethical actions. They don't lie because lying is haram. They do all the... They refrain from all the sins. But there are many actions which don't fall under the obligatory actions and the sins. For example, if someone is jealous and they don't express their jealousy, that's not a canonical sin. It's not a sin according to on to grudges for example sin according to the sharia but it contaminates the soul you see if you limit to the letter of the law you're missing the spirit of the law the rituals that we have in the letter of the law can either be confined to those physical actions and someone does one's utmost to realize those physical actions or one can go deeper looking into the philosophy and wisdoms behind those actions one who goes deeper succeeds in religion one who stays at the letter of the law it's good there may even be a heaven at the end of it, albeit a very basic time. But they've prevented themselves from a lot. I want just want to give an example of the wudu, the, the washing and the wiping of certain parts of the body. Sometimes that's all that people look at. The washing, and you see them washing a lot, and they really focus very much on the physical aspects of the washing, which is important up to a limit. But they go overboard. Because the aim there is only that physical washing or the physical wiping. That's all that bothers them. However, they don't look into the inner meanings of the wudu. And if they don't go into the inner meanings of wudu, they lose the plot. They don't, they'll never reach the objective. Because all rituals in the Sharia have underlying rationale behind them and wisdoms behind them. All of it being traced back to one thing and that's recalling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything in the Sharia. Now if you take the Sharia minus those esoteric wisdoms, it would be a very dry religion that you're practicing. Albeit acceptable from you and albeit good to some degree. But you wouldn't have grown. That's why you see many people, they do all the wajibat, refrain from the sins, but they're not very ethical people. They're not very spiritual people. Then you keep on looking at the wudu, only that physical washing and the limits and everything, and now, then the child asks you a question. Or you teach the child the ghost, for example, or the wudu, in this manner, that manner, then the child asks a question. They say that, well, we can have a shower, it'll be much cleaner than washing ourselves like that. And then you have no answer now, you see. It's a problem here. Now, children today, they're not like the children in the East of 20, 30, 40 years ago. They we just... People would, would do what they were told. 
the system in America, and it's not a bad system, but they teach the children to question everything, evaluate everything, criticize everything, until you get to the bottom of something, and that's good. But if the scholars don't pay attention to these questions and dilemmas that the children have, it's going to be a problem. Not that the, the children were at fault. We were at fault of accepting religion blindly to some degree. The children, it's impossible, those who were brought up in America, to accept anything blindly. And if they succeed, they'll be much stronger than we were. But most of them don't, because they don't have the answers. And that's the fault of people like me. They say, okay, we can take a shower. It's guaranteed it's much more cleaner and tidier than your ghost or your wudu. You keep on saying, no, Allah said, Allah said, but they have, to ra they have a rationality. They're thinking about this. But since you just look at the letter of the law, you never bothered to go through the wisdoms of the different rituals in Islam, you can't explain anything now to your children. They just have to believe like you did, but they can't. They were brought up here. Now, I just want to go through the one hadith in relation to the wudu. It's a very important hadith. And then you can ask yourself or make the correlation, if there is a correlation, that is this utmost benefit of wudu mentioned in this tradition? Is it, is, is it related at all to that physical washing? And the answer is no. Then we have to go and search for some answers. But I'll start off with the actual tradition. It's Hadith Qudsi. Hadith Qudsi means it's a sacred tradition. Being a sacred tradition means this. That when Allah speaks, not with a physical mouth or anything, and he reveals upon the Prophet his own words. That's what we call the Qur'an. But sometimes Allah reveals a meaning to the Prophet and that meaning the Prophet uses his own words to describe that meaning revealed upon the Prophet. It's a Prophet's words now, it's not God's words. That's called sacred traditions. So God is speaking but the Prophet is using his own words here. In this tradition, Allah is saying, now let me read the tradition one by one, then I'll go through it. Don't panic if it seems a bit difficult in the beginning. We'll go through it all by, one by one. So Allah is saying, Man ahdatha wa lam yatawadda faqad jafani. You may have heard of this tradition, but there are some elements that you may have missed. Whoever becomes a muhdith, a muhdith is someone whose wudu has become nullified. They've, they've slept, for example, or they've gone to the lavatory. Their wudu is now void. So one whose wudu has been nullified. Walam yatawadda, and they don't do a wudu after their wudu has become nullified. Allah says, فَقَدْ جَفَانِ Very, they have abandoned me. They've abandoned me, Allah. وَمَنْ أَحْدَثَ وَتَوَدَّ وَلَمْ يُسَلِّ رَكَأَتَيْنِ فَقَدْ جَفَانِ But someone whose wudu has become void, and they do the wudu after that nullification of their wudu, but they don't pray two units of salat. Allah says, they've abandoned me. وَمَنْ أَحْدَثَ وَتَوَدَّأَ وَسَلَّ رَكْأَتَيْنِ وَلَمْ يَدْعُنِي فَقَدْ جَفَانِي Someone whose wudu has become nullified. They do the wudu. They do the two units of salat after the wudu. But they don't supplicate before me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They've abandoned me. وَمَنْ أَحْدَثَ وَتَوَدَّأَ But someone who's become muhdith, their wudu has become not nullified, void. They do the wudu, وَسَلَّوْ رَكَأَتَيْنِ They do the two units of prayer, like the two units of prayer we do in the morning. 
Wada'ani and they supplicate after the two units to me Allah Walam ajibhu fi ma sa'alani min amri dini wa dunya so he does all that and he does a supplication and I Allah if I don't answer to what they are requesting be it in matters of their religion or matters of the worldly life if I don't answer فَقَدْ جَفَوْتُهُ I Allah have abandoned them وَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّنْ جَوْفِ and I'm not an abandoning Lord you see this is something incredible that here Allah is saying you just do these things whatever you want in your religion whatever you want in the worldly life I will give because I don't abandon people will Allah give all these things if you just look at the washing as a mere washing and the wiping as a mere wiping of course not the wudu has to be much more deeper than this it doesn't fit the two they don't correlate together merely washing and wiping does not lead to this spiritual benefit that Allah gives you whatever you want in the worldly life and in religious matters so there has to be something more to wudu now for 70 80 years of your life you just look at the washing and focus on it eventually you'll acquire waswas many people have waswas keep on washing it's washed you enter the domain of waswas it's very difficult to come out that's the satanic territory now only with Allah's help in the wudu every part of it now the wudu has a certain amount which is vajib to do it has many mustahab parts to it too but every part of the wudu there are these meanings that you have to recall when you're doing the wudu Imam Khomeini in his Adobu Salat says he refers to a book by Ibn Arabi he says in that book 150 different esoteric meanings of the wudu has been discussed now naturally we don't want everyone to do the 150 it's impossible but but you see those inner meanings of the wudu is important to appreciate to execute to do these things if you do those meanings recall those meanings during every limb yes your spirituality will be growing every time you do wudu you recall those meanings five times a day no eventually you'll be growing now I, I want to just describe one of those one of the esoteric meanings of the wudu and that's when we wash the arms from a bit higher than the elbow downwards we keep on washing it downwards this elbow joint is a very firm which we depend upon during our lives a lot in this world everything is a cause this microphone is air, this book, the car, food these are different causes in this worldly realm of multiplicities that we face in wudu, in this part of the wudu this is what we're saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh Allah I am drowned in this world of causes but you are the only cause you are the sole cause and I'm washing myself from all other causes because they're not real causes only you Allah are the real cause now what does that mean? you go to the grocery and get some food 
you don't see the grocer as the person who's providing sustenance. You see, Allah is Ar-Razaq. He is the provider of sustenance. You thank the grocer, but you see, Allah is Razaq. You go to the doctor, doctor cures you, and you thank the doctor, the etiquette has to be there. But you don't see the doctor as Ash-Shafi. Allah is the curer. You see, you're washing yourself from everything but Allah. Only Allah is the cause. You put the alarm on, on your car. Allah is hafid. You, d you don't see the alarm as the preserver. You drink water. We, we see the water as quenching our thirst. But we have to see Allah is as and so on and so forth. In all these actions, we slowly and gradually fill our hearts with Allah and empty our hearts with other than Allah. Let assigned anyone two hearts. heart. You can't love Allah and love in this process in wudu, look how important this is. It's training you for throughout the day when the teacher teaches you, when the, your employer gives you money. Allah is the ultimate employer. Allah is the ultimate teacher. Slowly by slowly with practice you fill the heart with Allah whilst living in this world. There's nothing wrong with it. Being married, children, at the workplace, university. But the process of filling the heart with Allah. This wudu is recalling that process. That's just one meaning. With every component of the wudu, you have to learn these. There are Arabic formulae to memorize, but there's no need to memorize. Even I don't know them off by heart. The meaning Whatever we have in Sharia, we call it. We shouldn't look at the Sharia as an ends in itself. It's a means to something. A means to recalling Allah. Aqim is salah, le dhikri. Do the salat, wish the salat to recall me, Allah subhanahu Everything in the Sharia is that. But if you just stick to the letter of the law, that physical dimension, minus the esoteric dimensions, you've wasted the soul. You're at loss. And the reason the Salat, we have five Salats which are Vajib, because there has to be a minimum which is made Vajib. If no Salat was Vajib, we'll all forget Allah. There was a minimum that Allah has assigned, and then we grow from that minimum. But the point is recalling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the boss is washing the whole body now. Why? There's a lot of delicate points here. So here we have to pay attention, we shouldn't confine and Islam to the letter of the law. The letter of the law is the start, it's an essential start, and you can't grow without it. But we have to grow further and further through the Sharia. Okay. Next, at Tariqatu Af'ali. The Tariqa is my actions. What actions are these? These are the noble ethical traits. If they hold steadfast on the path, we shall satiate them with abundant water. Imam Sadiq said, abundant water is divine knowledge. 
Sometimes water in the Quran is indicative of divine knowledge. You be steadfast on the tariqah, you'll be granted most definitely la asqaynahum. Most certainly you'll be given divine knowledge. Well, this tariqah can't be a fiqhi tariqah alone. Because you stick to the letter of the law, it's not guaranteed that you will be given divine knowledge. It's only a start. So this tariqah is something else. It's the actions of the Prophet, actions outside the jurisdiction of the Vajibat and the Muharramat now. These are the noble ethical traits. That's why the Prophet was sent in Nibu Ithtu the Utammima Makarim al Akhlaq. I've been sent to complete the noble ethical traits. Me, I mean, the Holy Prophet, has come to manifest the Muhammadan soul throughout mankind through his actions. What are the noble ethical traits? Now these, now these are difficult now. We, most of us fail. Someone's done you wrong, but you forgive. Someone suppressed you financially, then another day asks you for some money, you donate. Family ties have been broken, it's their fault, but you amend family ties. It's all about breaking the ego, eliminating the ego. These are difficult. Now you may ask, but there are many believers, not Muslims, non-believers, who do these things. So will they go to heaven or that kind of thing? Because they do the noble traits. The answer may be this, I don't know, but sometimes you forgive for Allah's sake. Sometimes you forgive for hu humanity's sake, you know, on humanitarian grounds. Both are good, however. Those who act humanitarianly, their soul won't elevate. They won't spiritually. Because it was done a lot less god lessly, assuming they were non-believers. Christians, if they have it, they share the same ruling as Muslims. They believe in God. But non-believers, there may be non-believers who may forgive it very well, donate. It wasn't done Allah fully. There was no Allah in the picture. Since there was no Allah in the picture, it's good action. They'll be rewarded for it. But there's no elevation of the soul. Elevation of the soul is a function of one's godliness that's why we have to do the tariqah after mastering the sharia we shouldn't segregate ourselves from the sharia it's important and then by mastering the sharia that godliness is built to a certain degree then it facilitates our execution of those noble ethical traits Also, like the Christians in Islam, we believe in forgiveness. Absolute forgiveness in one-to-one -one relationships. We believe in turning the other cheek. We believe in giving the other tunic. If someone does you wrong, Islam has no limit in forgiveness. See how much you can go. They're doing you wrong, you forgive. They swear, you forgive. They hit you, assuming that you can hit back. You forgive though, because if you can't hit back, there's no value in it. If someone has a, holds a gun to your head and you say, I forgive you, that doesn't make sense. Islam also accepts absolute forgiveness in one-to-one -one relationships, for Allah's sake. Yes, when it comes to a community, you can't, and that's what we saw in those one-to-ones, we have it in the Sira, the conduct of the Ahlul Bayt, we see it many times. They swore, they hid, they did everything to the Imams, but the Imam loved them. 
they would swear but they have compassion towards them it would bother the imam that they are sinning with the best tone with the best akhlaq they would do everything to try to get them on the path in one to ones we have that in Islam but when it comes to a community here someone can't forgive an act of oppression on behalf of the community and just leave it say I forgive you and then no the best interests of the community has to be served there no you have to fight for justice or fight against oppression you can't just leave it there But on one-to-ones, there's no limit. The next is the Hariqa. Now the Hariqa are or is my states, the Holy Prophet said. What were the states of the Holy Prophet? I never worshipped a Lord that I don't see. Amir al-Mu'minin said that. They would see Allah, not with the physical eye. They would taste Allah, not with the physical taste. They would hear Allah, not with the physical ear. These are states of the Prophet. Ata'ani, aj'aluka mithli. Allah says, you will obey me, I'll assign you like myself. We have that capacity too. Our Lord will assign us like Him. Being a manifestation of divine attributes. Being patient, generous, forgiving and so on and so forth. Now, someone may say, but the verse in the Holy Quran says, Laysa ka shay. Yes, Laysa ka mithli hi shay. There's nothing like Allah's like. We have to translate the calf and the myth. Why don't you translate both of them? They say the calf is superfluous. It's za'id. There's no need. It just emphasizes the point. No, well, the Uraf don't like that. There's no one like Allah's like, referring to the Ma'asumin. But we have that capacity. The capacity is there. And we have to be with the people in order to acquire divine, lordly attributes. If you're stuck in the house and don't associate and don't socialize, how are you going to learn being patient? How are you going to learn being forgiving? How, how are you going to learn being generous? You have to live with the people. But don't incorporate the people's sins. That's it. But you have to be with them. These are important points. Anyway, the haqiqa of these states of the Holy Prophet, we have that capacity too. Allah Metabo Taboy has said that religion comprises of haqiqa. That's the goal of religion. That's the objective of religion. Experiencing the states of the Prophet. If anyone asks you what's the goal of religion, this is the answer. Islam comprises of the haqiqa. Then he says, Allah the way to the haqiqa, the way to acquiring that, reaching haqiqa, the states of the Holy Prophet, is the tariqa. Once you perfect those noble ethical traits, you become closer and closer to experiencing those states. Then he says, the way to the tariqa is the sharia. In order to perfect those noble ethical traits, to reach that stage, you have to master the Sharia. You see, that's Salam Metabo Tabo is speaking now. How very delicately he's phrased the word. That's a tradition from the Ahlul Bayt. Love of the world is the root to all sins. Imam Khomeini has given a commentary to this. He says there are many actions which aren't haram in the Sharia. 
but they contaminate the soul, holding on to grudges, jealousy, and so on and so forth. It's not haram from a Sharia point of view, but you're contaminating the soul. This contamination, if it reaches a certain threshold, it will make you susceptible then to commit Sharia sins. Yes. Then there are another set of sins now, not in the realm of ethics. We call them Irfani sins. They're not Sharia sins. What are those? Someone loves a big house, loves a big car. There's nothing wrong with that according to the Sharia. But they love it. That's loving other than Allah. It's not haram. It's not unethical. But it's contaminating the soul. And that contamination, if it leads to a certain threshold, it will make you susceptible to ethical sins and then eventually to Sharia sins. And that's how we have to make sense of what happened to Zubair, what happened to Shemr. People like me are nothing compared to what Zubair was in relation to Wilaya. People like me are nothing compared to what Shemr was in relation to Wilaya. Shem, defender of Wilaya, battle of Sefain, defended Amir al Mu'minin. He almost became martyred. How come these people, what happened for them to change? Maybe this is what happened. That love of the world, now be it prestige, job, anything. It's not an ethical sin. It's not a Sharia sin. It's an Irfani sin. It's contaminating the soul. After five years, the effects may not be seen. Ten years, no. But 40, 50 years down the line, you'll eventually reach the threshold. Then you'll, it'll all break loose. It'll lead to ethical sins and then ultimately to Sharia sins. You then fight against Wilaya, for example. See, these are very delicate things and, and these, these people were strong like Zobeir. You know, we're nothing. Just look at how we should see ourselves. Okay, now. So, Sharia, Tariqa, Haqira, that's one classification we see in the traditions. Then there's other classifications that we see. One holy tradition attributed to the Holy Prophet says, Man shafi rasul sunni. One who lives on a par with the external side of the Prophet, they are Sunni. Sunni, the literal meaning of Sunni, those who abide by the Sunnah, the customs of the Prophet. If you like that Sharia dimension. وَمَنْ آشَفِي بَاطِنِ الرَّسُولِ فَهُوَ Sufi. But one who abides by the inner dimension of the Holy Prophet, that Tariqah, they are called Sufis. And there are so many traditions where this word Suf, which means wool, we see it in the many traditions. In the Tariqah, those noble ethical traits, invocations, the spiritual mantras and so on and so forth, one of the underlying principles is abandonment of the worldly life. You abandon the worldly life. Now, detach, detachment from the worldly life, abandoning the worldly life, doesn't mean, you know, living alone in a house monastically. No. It means have everything, but see and do everything Allah fully. Remember the washing of those causes. Fill your heart with Allah whilst you're married. Work, study, earn. If you do everything Allah fully, you're detaching from the worldly life. That's the main understanding of it. Not to just separate physically from everything. Once upon a time, one mistaq, 
one application of abandoning the worldly life was wearing woolen clothes. Now this may not apply today, but it applied once upon a time. But the woolen clothes per se wasn't the meaning, wasn't the be all and end all, wasn't the end. It was a means to something important. Just pay attention to these traditions, both from the Holy Prophet. Alaikum belevas suf. I enjoin upon you wearing woolen clothes. Tajiduna hila wa tal iman fi qulubikum. Then you will perceive the sweetness of faith in your hearts. Now, does woolen clothes itself lead to something into your heart? Of course not. Otherwise it will be very simple, even non-believers can wear woolen clothes and they will taste the sweetness of faith. Woolen clothes, it's a code, it's a means to something. Once upon a time, it was indicative of abandoning, detaching from the worldly life. You see, you can't take these traditions at face value. Man labisa suf raqa qalbo. One who wears wool, their hearts become softened. Softened means they become, the hearts become more accommodating towards spirituality. Does wool have that effect? Now you just focus on the wool now. You'll never get anywhere. These were just once upon a time examples of how to detach from the worldly life. One thing was wearing wool. There were many other things too. But this suf then became, gradually it became used so much and sufi which is someone who's treading along the spiritual tariqah in addition to the sharia but now they're also treading along that path of detaching from other than Allah and filling the heart with Allah Sufism is a science it's like Irfan it's the same it, there's two synonyms it's a science this science has principles. Those principles, like science, like medicine, are extracted from resources and sources. The Quran, traditions. Sufism or Erfan means tariqahology, the science of tariqah. The science of reaching Allah, that spiritual root to that haqiqah. It's a science. It's called tariqah. The study of tariqah. We, we can extract it from the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt. That's it. Now there may have been Sufis who have abused Sufism. That doesn't mean Sufism is bad. It doesn't mean Irfan is bad. You'll have a doctor, for example, who has abused his medicine, his knowledge in medicine. It doesn't mean you forget everything to, and put medicine aside. So here, Irfan, Sufism, it's that science of the tariqah, the science of acquiring that spirituality to reach in seeing, hearing, tasting Allah, not with the physical senses. Experiencing those states of the Holy Prophet, Ahwali. Now in Sufism, Although I, I don't want you to abuse this statement, there's no Sunni and Shiism anymore in the domain of the Tariqah. The labels of being Sunni and Shia are labels given in the realm of the external realm, the letter of the law, the, the Sharia. The Sharia labels you as a Sunni or a Shia. Once theology labels you as a Sunni, or a Shia. But once Tariqah, no. And that's why all the Sunnis say, all Sunni Tariqahs, they go back to Amir al Mu'minin. All of them say that. It doesn't apply here that much. 
But still, if you enter the tariqah with a solid sharia, it will be more productive. That I mean, no one's denying that. But the tariqah itself doesn't know of these labels. Now, Ayatollah Hassan Zada Omri has written in one of his works, Irfan is the science of building man, which in effect involves the soul's mi'raj, ascension, to knowing Allah and its elevation, the soul's elevation, by incorporating the divine lordly attributes within oneself. Takhallaqu bi'akhlaq Allah, the Holy Prophet said. Incorporate the divine attributes, Allah's attributes, within yourselves. By incorporating the divine law, the attributes within oneself, and to discipline oneself with the divine etiquettes. An erfanless community is tantamount to a lifeless corpse. Now this is Ayatollah Hassan Zadeh. In the same way in the Sharia, you go to the A'la, the most learned ones in the Sharia, in the Tariqah, go towards the A'la. Just because you are a Faqih, a Mujtahid in the Sharia, doesn't by default mean you're a Mujtahid or a Faqih or A'la in the Tariqah. No. Irfan, it's a science. It has to be studied. It has its own textbooks, like in Fiqh. Who are the A'lams today? You have to research as you research for the A'lam in Fiqh. Do your research. Names such as Oytullah Bahjad, they haven't come on our tongues for no apparent reason. Names such as Oytullah Hassan Zadeh, Imam Khomeini, these, were, these people were experts. All three of them, in addition to being Faqih. In Fiqh, Imam was a Faqih in philosophy, Irfan, Akhlaq, in his twenties. You don't have many people like this. That hadith on wudu which I said, that whenever you nullify, you do the wudu, two units of prayer, supplicate before Allah. I forgot to mention this. This Ayatollah Hassan Zadeh has given this as an instruction for, en for anyone. So you can be free to execute it. But do it once a day. Your wudu may be nullified ten times a day. You just do it once a day. Because always there's always the risk of burning yourself out. You may think you're made out of iron and everything. But you have to be careful. Then after a few weeks, do it twice a day. And I think it's better to stop at two. You'll know when to go more. But twice a day is good, yes. Their books are proof for us. Now, it doesn't have to be, you know, like a taqlidi thing in relation to the tariqah. We don't have that as such. And Sufism today has been so abused. We have all these cults. It's as if it's a religion. Whereas Sufism isn't a religion. It's a science. That's it. Religion is Islam. It's multidimensional. One aspect, one dimension is that of the tariqah. A community without irfan is tantamount to a lifeless corpse. Just stuck to the letter of the law. There's no spirit. True Irfan, Ayatollah Hassan Zawada says, is made up of the logic of revelation and the traditions issued by the infallibles. Okay. Imam Khomeini now. Imam Khomeini has something extra. He, I haven't seen it in anyone else's works. There's a very small difference between the Sufi and the Arif. Because up to now, we're saying Sufism and Irfan are synonymous. Imam writes, Sufism, no, Sufis and Urafa. Urafa being the plural of Arif. Sufism and Irfan, which are commonly used terms, their usage, however, are usually not observed. And there is, in fact, a difference. Irfan is that science that explores the levels of oneness of Allah and His manifestations in a manner dictated by Irfani taste. Now what this means, inshallah, for those who attend tomorrow's lecture at ASU, I'll open this up there, this requires a bit of it. 
as well as exploring the fact that existence and the order of the cosmos are all manifestations of absolute beauty and His, Allah's essence. That's what Irfan does. Whoever has knowledge in relation to this science is called an Arif, the science of acknowledging that whatever is is a manifestation of Allah and the science of acquiring unity with that essence of Allah whoever has knowledge of how to get there and whoever has knowledge of the fact that whatever is is a manifestation of Allah's attributes they are called an Arif so it's still an academic thing and whoever converts this knowledge to the practical dimension transferring it from one's aqli dimension into one's heart such a person is called a Sufi it's, it's not merely an academic process anymore so there's a small difference between the Sufi and the Arif okay now as I said Sufism has been abused one form of abuse is by segregating Sufism from the Sharia. That's an abuse of Sufism. And sometimes we see in the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, they are cursing or they are going against the Sufis. They're speaking against, reproaching the Sufis. Why? Because those Sufis were separating the Sharia from religion. And sometimes we see Sufis attacking Sufis. When you see that, it's because one of them, they, they want a Sufism minus Sharia. That's wrong. Islam is multidimensional, but we have to always have those dimensions of it. You can't get engrossed in one dimension of Islam. The attributes of majesty, Jalali attributes, and the attributes of Allah's beauty, the Jamali attributes, both together have to be observed. What does that mean? Sometimes you see a father who's a scholar and the son has such a good father-son relationship the son becomes engrossed in the father's compassion, love and everything that the son neglects the father's attributes of majesty like he's the boss, he's the leader, this, that and the other and then they don't listen anymore to the father because they're so drowned in the attributes of compassion and everything that father may be very a serious man leader in the community but for that son because the son was drowned in the compassion sympathy of the father he's now he's discarded the other dimension of leadership from the father and therefore he gets engrossed in the one dimension and doesn't listen anymore the reason why the Imams, the Ma'asumin, would always still do their Salat even though they had reached the highest stages because they always observe the Jalali attributes of Allah do this, do that they never neglected that dimension, those attributes of Allah and then they both are important for that balanced Arif another way it's been abused is scholars who have learned a few terms and a few sciences let's say in the seminaries in Qom or wherever then now they're making a business out of it because you know it, this is the core of religion now it's important it really elevates people people are thirsty for it after the Sharia in the same way we're thirsty for a maraji we can see what, what are the do's and don'ts of the Sharia people will come to them, they make a business out of it now Imam Khomeini in relation to this last group of people he has a very interesting passage in 40 hadith and I'll read this passage and inshallah I'll stop if I have the time there's no, there's no clock here Yes. is it okay to go? yes here, Imam says in 40 hadith, he says the Arif who 
who disdains others on account of his pride in relation to his mystic knowledge. So an Arif has learned this mystic knowledge and as a result they disdain others. They say, I, have, I have this. I have this knowledge you don't. And this pride comes in and considers others to be superficial and shallow. Although the text says and considers others superciliously to be superficial and shallow. So I, for example, have learned this knowledge of Irfan, and I see you people, for example, as superficial people, shallow people, that kind of attitude, because of my pride of learning something. What knowledge, Imam is saying, does he possess about God, except for a handful of concepts and terms that are in reality veils of realities and hindrances in this religious path. This arrogance and pride they've acquired as a result of as knowing a few simple terms, it's led to their arrogance. This arrogance is going to be an impediment, an obstacle for them to spiritually journey towards Allah. What is this knowledge except for a number of glamorous and gaudy terms which do not have any relevance whatsoever to the knowledge of God? No, don't, don't be fooled. It's only a set of terms. The knowledge of God is much something else. How far are they from the knowledge of God and the knowledge of His names and attributes? Knowledge is a quality of the heart. And in the view of this writer, referring to himself, all these are practical sciences and consist not of mere acquaintance with certain abstract concepts or artful juggling of terms. With this short life and limited knowledge, Imam Khomeini is saying, I have seen certain people amongst these so-called Orafar and other scholars who I swear by Irfan and the knowledge that these terms have not made any mark on their hearts. It's all an ego problem. They're drowned in ego. If you want to tell a true aura from one who's not, look at is he making a business out of it? Is he earning out of his science, his knowledge? Is he treating others? Does he treat the elderly gentleman different to the young child? Does he neglect some of the community, but he, he, he always has breakfast with the rich, for example? Is he getting money from people? Does he have an ego problem? These are signs of the tariqah. These are signs of someone who doesn't have the noble ethical traits. Nay, they have rather left on them an opposite effect. My friend, the Irfan of Allah makes the heart a place where Allah's names, attributes and essence are manifested. We want to incorporate divine attributes within ourselves. The heart, our soul, is a place where we want Allah's attributes to manifest. The, the Holy Prophet was manifesting the Muhammadan soul. The heart is a place where Allah's attributes have to manifest. A stage for the appearance of the real king, the real monarch. That's Allah, who obliterates all signs and purges it of all stains and removes from it all limitations. You incorporate Allah, Allah's attributes within you, it'll eliminate all stains and impurities from you. When the real king comes in, all ego will go away. Then Imam mentions this verse of the Quran. Now this verse of the Quran, Imam is referring to the esoteric, the inner understanding. The inner esoteric layer of this verse. Otherwise the external understanding of the verse has no relevance to the context of the discussion. It's in relation to Queen Sheba Sabo when she was discussing with her cabinet this the 
Sulaiman alayhi salam and his army, they're coming. What are we going to do here? What's your advice? The cabinet then said to Queen Sheba, now, this is not the external meaning that we want to see. We want to see what the inner meaning is. Imam, that's his purpose here. I'll tell you what it is. Let me just read the verse. إِنَّ الْمُلُوْ إِذَا دَخَلُوا قَرْيَةً أَفْسَدُوهَا Verily the kings, when they enter a town, they ruin it. وَجَعَلُوا أَعِزَّةَ أَهْلَهَا أَذِلَّهَا And they'll degrade that town's men of honor. That's a piece of external advice given to the queen. So let's, let's build relationship with them. That's one meaning. The esoteric meaning, which Imam wants to say, is that when the kings enter a town, the town being the heart, the kings being Allah's divine attributes, when the divine, the real king now, when the real king, the divine attributes, enters the heart, it'll ruin it. It'll kill and eliminate all traces of the ego. I am this, I am that, this so-called honor I have, this, it'll be all eliminated when one incorporates Allah's attributes within oneself. Imam Khomeini, very, he was precise in his words. It converts your heart into that of a Muwahid, a, mono, a true monotheist, and one filled with the praise of the Lord. But why then did it make your heart, the so-called RF's heart, a place of your own glorification? You keep on speaking about yourself. I did this, I did that. I'm better than him, I did. You don't have the presence of the real king within you. It was just a few terms you learned, it led to your arrogance. But why then did it make your heart a place of your own glorification? Why has it added unnecessary colors to it and accumulated trappings and accretions that deter you from obtaining nearness to God? Deter you from obtaining nearness to God Almighty and from beholding the effulgent glory of His names. Why it has made your heart an abode of Satan and so you look down on the servants of God and His chosen ones, the signs and reflections of Allah's glory and splendor. Woe upon you for your wretchedness, O Arif, whose condition is worse than of anybody else, and all the doors of defense and pretext are sealed upon Him. You are proud towards God and have assumed a pharaonic arrogance towards His names attributes and all the manifestations of his essence. O oh, amateurish student of concepts who has gone astray of the realities, deliberate over the matter for a while and think as to what knowledge you possess of God. What impact has the knowledge of God and his attributes made on yourself?